Hi there, my name is uh, Father Eric Nikolai. I'm coming to you now online from here, from Ernst Cliff College in my office. And uh, it's a pleasure for me today to give you, well, a brief talk on um, the relationship between art and medicine. That's what I was asked to do since I did a degree in art history. So I thought it'd be interesting to at least uh, give you some ideas that uh, might simply um, you know, open a discussion, if you like. And uh, I have a bit of a sore throat because I came down with COVID, but you won't get it through the... You won't get it online, so I guess it was a good idea to have it online. So um, what am I going to talk to you about? Well, I thought it might be interesting uh, to talk to you about one of my favorite... Uh, artists, my favorite painters from the 17th century, from the Netherlands, a Dutch painter that you all know. His name is uh, Rembrandt von Ring, von Ring, and uh, born in Amsterdam and um, was really one of the great uh, portrait uh, painters of his time, but also a biblical painter, uh, history painter, really, uh, really a great uh, great painter that uh, you could, I suppose, uh, spend hours talking about. But I'm going to talk today really about his first group portrait called The Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Taupe, Nicholas Taupe. And this was the first time he was only something like uh, 25 years old, uh, Rembrandt, when he did this. You can see from this uh, self-portrait that he has here uh, that... Um, that this was done exactly at that, that same year, the self-portrait. Uh, so it was quite unlikely that he be able to get this uh, commission uh, of this uh, Surgeon's Guild, you know, because Surgeon's Guilds were, well, let's say group portraits were very popular in that time and they were a way of uh, fomenting the prestige of the members of that guild. So. Um, there were many other great painters at the time that were far more prestigious than young 25-year-old Rembrandt, but nevertheless he got he got the commission, and he was very proud of this painting in the end, and he put a lot of effort and work into it and made it actually quite a masterpiece, even though it was one of his first ones. Later on, he would uh, paint other ones, like, uh, for example, the Amsterdam's uh, Guild uh, of the uh, Draper's Guild, which were dated to 1662, he was much older at that time, and that too, the Draper's Guild, is a very famous painting, but uh, in my view it doesn't have the same power as the anatomy lesson of uh, Dr. Taub. So let's just go over uh, this this painting um, so that we can, you know, get some idea of its power and how it relates to, um, you know, modern medical science today or just doctors in general today. Uh, especially for you as Catholic uh, Catholic doctors, so um, so the first thing to say is that it was quite common at that time, seventeenth century, to have group portraits like this, and um, in this case, it was the the Amsterdam Guild of Surgeons, and it was headed by this this fellow by the name of uh, Doctor Nicholas Tulp, who was. Uh, specialized in anatomy so he was known for his uh, abilities but he was also a civic leader he was extremely uh, you know uh, sort of prestigious he was very well versed in anatomy uh, but also he he would apprentice uh, surgeons that would come and learn from him right and so each man in this painting has to pay a certain amount to appear in this portrait just to be able to appear in the portrait was already a sign of prestige. In fact, if you were closer, you had to pay more. If you were a little further away, you had to pay less. Right? And so um, each man has these unique uh, facial expressions that are meant to show fascination and real kind of uh, professional drive as they look at uh, Dr. Tulp here uh, with his fingers together there, if you like, as he's digging <laughs> into the, the forearm of uh, this cadaver. Now, what is fascinating about this is that this was meant for the prestige, of course, of, of the guild members. But really, the central figure here that everybody notices, and it's much more than all other uh, group portraits like, like this, is the, is the cadaver. 
and we know who he is. His name was Aris Clint, Aris Clint, and he will. He was a thief who was caught red-handed. He was trying to steal somebody's cloak, and he did it with a, like a knife or something like that. But they caught him. Like the police went after him, they caught the guy, and he was tried and hanged on that very day. And well, it turns out that he was uh, tried in January. And so this portrait uh, represents the anatomy lesson that took place in January 31st. Uh, 1632. They had to do these uh, public, these were public lessons where everybody could uh, appear, but they had to do them in January, as you can imagine. There was no refrigeration at that time, and this was the only way they, they could really do it for a you know, relatively extended way of showing, uh, to be able to show you know, the, the body like that. Now, if you, if you look at Dr. Tulp here, he's, uh, he's got his fingers together, and presumably as he's pulling, right, with, these, uh, you know, with that instrument, he's pulling the tendons that he is suggesting are making that, you know, that movement. And they're all like in awe that he knows which tendons are able to do this. Now, apparently, uh, later um, doctors or you know physicians have looked at this and he's nah, it's not too accurate and so. But but what's also interesting is if you look on the right, well, on the right you see Doctor Tulp. He's the one wearing the hat, right? And on the very far right corner, you see that right down there. That is a book that he's got open. They're both looking at the book, right? And at uh, at uh, Dr. Tulp here and, and the, the open forearm there of uh, our friend uh, Aris Klint, the, the cadaver. But we know now that, that that book that they're looking at is a very famous anatomy textbook by a Belgian uh, surgeon or Belgian anatomist by the name of Andreas Vesalius. Eh? And he wrote a book called De Humani Corpus Fabrica. Uh, the uh, Mani uh, Corpus Fabrica, the fabric of the human body, dates to the mid 16th century, about 1543 or so. And uh, it's, as you can see, it's propped up there. And um, there are numerous copies of this in the Metropolitan uh, Museum there in, uh, in New York. And um, it was a, a tremendous, that book was a tremendous advance uh, in anatomy for the time. It had challenged earlier books, right? Uh, but you'll notice, of course, that, um, that what is, let's say, quite powerful is that they are looking at drawings, anatomy drawings, to learn about anatomy. But they're also doing it while actually doing a live that the live a, a dissection right of a real uh, cadaver right so it shows the impact of artists now under this guy Vesalius he had to obtain good painters and good artists to do these drawings of um, you know of dissections or or, or, or of sometimes skeletons and, uh, and so this was already or originally done by people like um, uh, Da Vinci Michelangelo they did drawings of cadavers in order to be able to learn more of the musculature of the body and so forth but also of course these original drawings were done uh, were done by by well with the interests of uh, surgeons and people in anatomy and it is this guy um, this guy uh, Vesalius who is really the guy who, who's really writing the book there or the book that they're looking at uh, he's at the origin of the very science of anatomy, right? I mean, there were surgeons and stuff, but very often they would look at animal animal parts and animal bodies, and like they were basically saying it was more or less the same thing, and he's saying how, how unique the, the human body really, in fact, is, right? So um, there was a big advance in uh, the anatomy, or the science of anatomy, right? Thanks to artists, right? And, and of course, surgeons like uh, Vesalius, but he used artists, right? And now, so it's uh, it's uh, Rembrandt painting a real dissection going on with the help of uh, Vesalius's textbook. So this sort of upped the prestige of Vesalius as a textbook to guide people in anatomy. But it was meant, of course, to show the prestige of these these fellows. But only two of these guys here are actual um, are actual surgeons, right? And and of course, what was meant to, uh, to underline to, to be underlined here is that. The most important figure here is Dr. Tulp. One way to show that, of course, is he's got his hand out in this beautiful way. It's like a, like a, like a, like a, like a, sh almost like a photographic moment. You know, just, just as he's going like that, 
takes, he snaps the picture. But he's the more important figure also because he's got a hat on. Now, uh, if you'll notice, all the other ones are, have no hats on, but if you look at the fellow at the back, at the top, it's a kind of a pyramidal form here, you know, with all these figures, right? Uh, and this fellow here at the at the back, I, I haven't managed to figure out his name. I'm sure we know names of some of these guys, but that fellow originally, it seems, had a hat on. And then when Dr. Taub, Nicholas Taub, saw the painting by Rembrandt, he said, "That's that's not good. He will detract from my importance." Right. So uh, Rembrandt had to remove the hat. So if you look carefully, you can see it was what they call pentimenti, the, these these like a decision to make changes in a painting. Right. So. And that was just before he varnished it, right? So you can see it carefully. But but also what is interesting is that um, in the cadaver, uh, since this man had been caught stealing somebody's cloak, well, the typical um, uh, punishment was, of course, normally it was a death penalty by hanging. But before that, since it was uh, a th- he was a thief, they would typically chop off his hand, which they did. <laughs> but... Rembrandt was good enough to add his hand back, like to paint it back, right? So, uh, who knows if that hand is actually the, the you know the, the hand that was caught or or the other one? I don't know, but uh, probably this hand here on the left was the one uh, that had been chopped off. But you know, it's it's very very to me it's very obviously very very gruesome, right? Um, and so, what I want to underline here simply is this: is that this painting was meant to be a sign of prestige for those who are in this group portrait. It was meant to show their, I don't know, their greatness and their, you know, their statesmanship and so forth. But in the end, the only person we all really remember is is this poor guy, eh, the cadaver, the, this poor guy, Aris, Aris Klint. And, um, and no other group portrait has the same effect on us. And uh, the only thing that this reminds me of eh, are paintings of the deposition eh, when Jesus is taken down from the cross. Eh? You got, of course, the famous uh, Roger van der Weyden, Roger van der Weyden uh, painting from 1443, which I saw in uh, the Prado back in 2011 when I went there for World Youth Day, and it's just, just a spectacular. Uh, painting, but it was also done for a guild, right? And this was done for the Crossbow Guild, and that they obviously there's no members in that painting, but it's just a representation of the deposition, but there you see how the Lord is being taken down for the cross uh, in that beautiful form and then Our Lady swooning and kind of echoing the same uh, form as Our Lord. And so, you know, that's it's a dead body being lowered, and Our Lady is clearly not dead, but she's kind of echoing that in some way. Or the famous painting by uh, Caravaggio from 1600, around 1600, which was only like 25 years or so before uh, the painting of Dr. Taupe. And um, the Caravaggio, of course, is typical of the Baroque period and has this drama around this uh, dead figure. And another painting that I think is very famous, of, of course, is uh, Mantegna's Lamentation of uh, of Christ from the 15th century, from 1480. That's a very, very fa- famous painting because it also here shows uh, foreshortening. You see that you can see how the this time our Lord is in the tomb already, and there's the there's the figures around him very, very tightly, you know, set in that tomb. You can see Mary Magdalene; she brought the the oil and so forth. You can see the oil there. It's really quite stunning. And there, there are many, of course, other paintings, both during Caravaggio, uh, both during um, Rembrandt's time of the deposition. And I think that you know, giving centrality to a dead body like that is, is kind of e- echoed here in in the famous uh, painting of Doctor, the Anatomy Lesson of Doctor Tulp. Right? And um, now in these um, surgeries or in these anatomy lessons, they would normally do the thorax at the beginning, or at least the, the chest cavity at the beginning, because those internal organs would normally um, decay first. But so here, of course, he only has the forearm open and the rest is closed. So that is likely, you know what I'm saying, like it's likely just like theater. They're n- this is not how the actual anatomy lesson took place. And plus they're all dressed in their finest here. They, they wouldn't have been dressed like that. Uh, they would have been presumably covered. Nobody goes to <laughs> to anatomy lesson dressed like that, right? So it, there's some obviously some theater there, right? But I think that would be understood, right? Um, but um, 
And so uh, it was commissioned, this painting, to be displayed in the guild room, the, the Guild of Surgeons, and uh, it sort of, in some ways, gives an, a, you know, a glimpse into the importance of the, chain, the cha medical changes that were going on in that place, especially in the area of uh, anatomy. And uh, uh, now you could say that... Uh, you know, we, we don't have public executions or, or even dissections. This was a public event that everybody could see, right? Not just uh, members of the guild. It was meant to show that the members of the guild well, were somehow prestigious, right? And um, also, uh, what is uh, important here is that um, though the church didn't uh, necessarily look down upon upon dissections or, you know, examining uh, bodies, uh, there is a, an importance given, after all, to the human body and its dignity, even once it's dead, and it must always uh, be conserved in its integrity, right, as a sign of respect for the body, the person itself, of course, but also as an expression of faith and to the resurrection, like you, you try to always, um, you know, maintain the integrity, right, uh, as a sign that, well, it's this body, this this fellow here who you know who uh, who will rise again you know and uh, this Aris Clint, he will rise again even though he's being uh, dissected and so all these parts were always uh, kept together right and um in in um in Protestant Holland these were much more um common than in Catholic countries uh, in Catholic countries Italy and Spain they, they were not as common right they, they were done but it wasn't looked. It was. They weren't. Let's say public events, right? And uh, let's say in Catholic, in in Holland, which is more Protestant, that let's say there was less of that, maybe that respect for the integrity of the body because of the belief in the in the resurrection, or or like let's say, not the same belief, right? And so, but what I simply want to say here is that we are constantly drawn uh, into this body of uh, the cadaver, right? We're constantly drawn to him, and it's kind of like. You know, Dr. Tulp, you're a nice guy, but, you know, we're always, there's a kind of empathy for this poor guy who, you know, who, yes, committed a crime, but, I mean, <laughs> doesn't look like he really deserved, you know, to be, uh, to be, uh, you know, hung like this, right? So there's an empathy that I feel for him, certainly, and, um, and so, as well as the fact that it, it connects me with the deposition. But we know that Rembrandt was very proud, and, we, you know, he signed it, it says in the upper corner there, it says uh, Rembrandt, Fetchit, 1632. Yeah, Rembrandt made this, basically, right? And um, I would say this, that uh, with, well, without this painting of Dr. Tulp, uh, it would be m difficult to imagine other great paintings, later paintings, such as, for example, Thomas Eakin's painting, The Gross Clinic, The Gross Clinic, right, which is uh, a painting from the 19th century, 1876, right? Now, this is not a painting of a, a dissection of a cadaver, but of a real live guy, you know, and, uh, and it's in um, the Surgeon's Amphitheater there in uh, Jefferson, Jefferson Medical College, and there's Dr. Gross showing, uh, you know, a clinic of five doctors, you know, and they're all operating on, on this patient, and you'll see that lady there, and she's like in horror, because the patient, that, that is his mother, right? So she's kind of freaking out at the fact that uh, he, he has some kind of problem with his leg or something, a bone infection, I believe it was. And, uh, you know, the mother recoils at, at seeing this, right? But, but this doctor here in the, in the center, you know, he just gives this sort of, you know, certitude and confidence, you know, and that we're going to help, kind of like help this man. You know? and, and it's all transmitted through this beautiful, it's probably one of the greatest paintings by Thomas Eakins at that time, you know, 1876. So, um, uh, so that's one uh, way in which we can link uh, works of art, great, great, great classic works of art, eh, with you know the the practice of medicine, and of course, in there deep down is uh, the respect for the body, the dignity of the body, eh, created obviously by God, infused uh, by the Holy Spirit, uh, infused by with a, with a spiritual a spiritual soul, eh? and uh, I think this is one of the greatest uh, paintings of um, of Rembrandt, the Anatomy Lesson of Doctor Tulp. And uh, I think you know it's a good uh, occasion. Even even the the later paintings, which were really really great when he's become a totally world renowned, so to speak, uh, you know, they don't have the same attraction. I think than this great uh, painting.